the market is full of games. There's thousands of games to choose from coming out on a monthly basis. Uh, CCG market is crowded. Does anybody care about anything other than D&D from the role-playing world? Why can't I get a copy of the Old World rulebook? Dragon Ball Fusion is allocated. I can't believe it happened again. The Dune, new Dune movie is releasing. Is there anything that is going to impact what I'm going to order based on pop culture stuff? How do I sort through the noise and pick the games that actually matter? Uh, stay right here and find out. So welcome back to Game Retail Ramblings. This is episode four. I'm coming to you from Drizzly, Rochester, New York today at Millennium Game Studios, home of the largest game store in the industry. Uh, today we're going to talk about how I pick the games that I'm going to sell. Um, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. It's free to do so. My biggest role in this business is primary buyer. Um, I'm going to put a caveat on that, and I'm going to say that at this point, uh, buying has gotten to be so large for the store that it's not just me anymore. Uh, I've got other employees that help me out with that. I've got some employees that have entire sections of the store where they order. Uh, some of them were trained by me. Uh, some of them we collaborate with based on the decision making um, and figure out what's successful and what isn't. And I sort of mentor them in a way to, to get them up to speed with that. And typically those decisions just come from their own passion, the things that they like to sell. I've found that if you're passionate about something, your headspace is in that particular product line, that genre, uh, your value and your acumen for that is, is what I need to be able to pick what other customers are gonna like for that sort of thing. So the caveat that I'm gonna list here is this is the process that I go through. Their process may be different. I have a handful of them that order in different areas. They could get on here and tell you something completely different. But for the most part, this is the way that I decide, okay, these are games that are going to be things that I think matter, things that I think matter to our customers, things that I think can be really, really big if I can get this these products out in front of a customer and they get to see how exciting and how fun they are to play. So when I was hired here... I started part-time and then I worked into a full-time role. And the way that I did that was by implementing the point of sale system that we had back then. And part of doing that was transitioning into the primary buyer. At that time, there was a there was a couple of people that were doing the buying. There was one person that was focused on Games Workshop and another person that was doing role-playing and a third person that was doing CCGs, so on and so forth. And over a period of time, I kind of just gobbled those all up and I took those all underneath um, my purview and started working with those different brands, different genres, and at, at one point I was ordering all the product that came in the door for the store. In order to do that, what I found myself doing and as part of this series was when an opportunity came up to go to a trade show or a convention or a distributor open house, I got my butt in the car, I got on a plane, and I flew out to meet these people. I started establishing relationships with the publishers. I started looking at games in person. I started seeing how important things were like previews, uh, knowing what was coming in the market ahead of time, as opposed to sort of trying to react to it after the customers are already in the store looking for something that I should have been doing my homework on before. Now, back then, things were a lot easier uh, in terms of the number of releases that would come out in any given week I spent a lot more time on the phones with my reps back then they uh, email wasn't as big of a deal back then I email primarily now for everything anybody that knows me or that talks to me knows that specifically I don't pick up the phone very often unless it's my mom calling so when it comes to ordering back then a lot of the ordering was just a conversation that I had with my rep while I was walking around the store looking at things and running reports and that sort of thing so fast forward a little bit I, I establish some relationships I get out I, I figure out what the landscape looks like and then I start looking around to try to figure out how I'm gonna to piece together the the hits that matter some of that information previously would come from my sales rep because he had a he had a finger on the pulse in the way that I didn't I was new to the industry I didn't know all the players and I didn't definitely didn't know all the games um, so I slowly crept my way sort of through that and I started by building those relationships and getting familiar with the people in the industry that mattered so as I progressed through that and got to meet people and have conversations and follow up and, and do some networking, I also was able to have a handful of retailers that I became friends with. Those retailers had similar business philosophies that I did. They didn't necessarily have the same size store. Their focus wasn't necessarily on what our primary focus was, but all of us were trying to sell games. So 
having retail relationships also helped in that process because they sort of they could gut check me at times if I was going to take a big swing on something. Uh, having somebody else that I respected and that I knew was sort of in it the same way that I was, even though it was their store and their investment made things a lot more smooth. It didn't mean that we, it didn't mean that collectively we hit a home run every single time. But what I, what I came to find out is a lot of times if I talked to other retailers at these shows and had conversations with them about the stuff that didn't sell, a lot of times all of us missed on the same thing, which was also reassuring for me too. So today, you know, primary focus, we're going to talk about games, what tools I use, what things are helpful to me in order to, to try to do the best that I can about curating games. Uh, I had a ranty post on Facebook the other day that was a quote that I've seen so many times from retail. The, the two things that I, that I hear other retailers say a lot that drive me absolutely bonkers is, they must hate money in response to looking at the way that a retailer or a sales outlet has decided to price a particular product. And I didn't bring any in because I didn't have any customers that asked me to order it. If I only brought in the things that customers, primary customers asked me to carry in the store without just using my professional acumen to curate the products that are in the store, I wouldn't carry most of the stuff that I have now. The same goes for well, I don't like that game, so I'm not going to carry it. It doesn't matter whether I like the game all that much. It just matters if I can sell the game because my goal is to sell games, to keep the lights on, to keep my employees' paychecks flowing, that sort of thing. So the customer's job isn't <laughs> to come in and inform me what it is I should be carrying. It's great when we do get that feedback, but the reality of it is the majority of the customers come in and purchase things without having any conversation with us re with regard to what they'd like us to stock or what we might need or this or that or the other thing. The ones that do great, appreciate it. Uh, I need those, those kinds of insights and things, but we also do other things to figure out what the potential market for a particular game might be. As an example, we ran uh, the Star Wars Unlimited Roadshow. So Asmodee was nice enough to put together uh, an opportunity for retailers to be able to Use some starter decks to figure out if if players in your area wanted to be able to to purchase Star Wars Unlimited when it came out, and and it was pretty successful. Those opportunities are are incredible. Being able to have that stuff ahead of time, show it to some customers, give them an idea, a taste of what the game is before they have to make purchasing decisions. That's that's like triple A chef's kiss type stuff. So today I'm going to give uh, seven things that are part of the arsenal that I have for picking games. It, these are in no particular order. This isn't a top seven, but it's certainly seven different things that come into play when, it, when I'm evaluating a game. Some of these are gonna be focused on uh, more on board games. Some of this is focused on maybe miniatures a little bit more. Some of it's focused on CCGs, but most of it can, af can have a direct application to everything that you're looking at. So number one on the list is appearance. My employees can't be in every single aisle talking to every single customer for every single interaction, which means that there's an amount of lifting that your box art and the back of your box is going to need to do as a publisher in order to get consumers excited about a game. Sometimes it doesn't matter because the game is just absolutely incredible and everybody just can't wait to come in to buy it. Most of the time, though, having an evocative cover is going to help you out. Now. There are games out there that buck that trend. I, I, I would say, and this is no offense to AEG or any of the folks over there, Cascadia does not have the most evocative cover that I've ever seen in the world. And we sold you know more than 100 copies of that game last year. So it can buck the trend, but in most cases, the more evocative your cover is, the better it looks, the less beige that's on the cover, um, the more likely it is to stand out. You know, when I think about box art that is pretty attractive and that looks good, you know, sometimes less is more. If you if you look at a game like Pantone that just has that red with the Pantone at the bottom, it makes people walk over there and see what it is. The back of the box should be your salesperson. If an employee isn't in the store to talk to the customers about the specific game, the customer should be able to turn that game over and be able to get maybe a 30 second pitch as to what they're going to see on that game and what the game might feel like, you know, player count, 
time of play, some of what the uh, the, the game is going to be about and what they can expect. Occasionally, some publishers will put genre in. There's pluses and minuses to that. If people don't know what a cooperative game is, there's no there's no value to that. If they don't know what a social deduction game is, there's no value to that. Now, as our industry has matured more, those game those game terms have become more commonplace, but if you're looking at opening yourself up to a broader market and a broader audience, which is what we've seen as a store post-COVID, then having less specific game terms and better explanations on the back of the box as to what those things mean is even more valuable because then I don't have to have somebody looking up vocabulary words to understand if this is going to be something they're excited about. Uh, number two for me is publisher track record. This is important to me on a, on a couple of different levels. The reality of it is for better or for worse, if I don't like you as a publisher, I don't have to carry your games. And I can say that about every single publisher that I carry right now. There isn't a publisher that I have in the store right now that I couldn't remove from my shelves and still be able to manage and, and have a successful business. Some would hurt more than others, but at this point we're diverse enough where if something isn't doing well and something else is doing better, we can lean into that thing and make that shift to make sure that the store stays successful uh, in the way that it has over the last 38 years of its existence, give or take. So publisher reputation and in, in, in my relationship with publishers and their relationship to me and their relationship to the consumer plays a huge role in whether I, how I look at your catalog, how I decide to make those buying decisions, whether or not I carry expansion products. There's a whole number of things that go into that. So the other side of that is their batting average too. Um, I'm going to pick on, I'm going to pick on Pandasaurus a little bit because I know Molly and Nathan can take it. Uh, Pandasaurus is a, is a great publishing partner for us. Their direct ordering system is, is, is phenomenal. Brian that works for them is a really good uh, retail sales rep, a great catalog. They've had a lot of really, really solid products in, in, a, in a variety of price points as well. Uh, during COVID, they had, you know, some some definite misses in their product catalog. Uh, the, 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 roller, the roller skating game or the skateboarding game and a couple of the others. It just did not look like the normal stuff that we saw kind of coming through uh, their offers. And I can say now, fast forward to Gen Con this year, looking at their booth, seeing, you know, Beacon Patrol and Sea Salt and Paper and Wolves and a bunch of the other stuff. Uh, it's obvious that they've come out of COVID. They've gotten themselves back into the mindset that they were before, which is bringing awesome looking games, innovative games, quality games, well-priced games back to the market because that batting average has gone up quite a bit. So it's really... Pandasaurus now has earned an amount of quality to their line that I have to look at absolutely everything that's coming down the pipe from them. I have to at least give it a glance. And the reality of it is sometimes I will order those games blind just because I'm not worried about whether or not it's going to be a good game or not. Um, just because it's coming from a publisher that I'm comfortable with and I'm familiar with. I've seen their media. Uh, I've seen their marketing engine spin up in a way where they have put it in front of enough eyeballs that I know that my local market is going to care about what that is. Uh, number three is influencers and buzz. Some of the influencers that I, that I listen to or some of the influencers that I pop in and I, I, I take a look at are shut up and sit down and, and dice tower. There's a handful of others that I, that I go in and I'll, I'll play around with if I'm at home on YouTube. But for the most part, the majority of the stuff that I get, comes from those uh part of the reason why it, i think shut up and sit down does a really good job at picking things that matter and things that are relevant and things that are not maybe the best known games and i i, I like their style so they entertain me as well uh tom and his team over at dice tower at this point uh, it's hard to find a better produced uh set of shows his channel has, has grown and matured a lot in a lot of good ways and um I think their feedback, depending on who's talking about what specific title is valuable, they all have their own bias and they even lean into that a lot on the show, which I can appreciate. Um, so I know ahead of time who's going to like what style game, but that doesn't mean that they're actually going to like that game. 
So influencers is, is important to, uh, to, to me in general. I go through phases with them. Sometimes I've got them in the car all the time. Sometimes I'm listening to the podcast and sometimes I'm just, I, I'm not ready for it. And I want some, you know, Wynton Marcellus jazz on the way in instead. So, you know, they're, they're off and, and I'm on to a different world. Buzz is something that's a little bit harder to, to figure out. It's an easy word to use, but how is it that I measure buzz on something? Well, buzz on something comes from, there's a lot of retail Facebook groups that I'm in. If retailers are throwing out conversations about stuff, even if they're, if, especially if they're confused about something or if they hate something. Uh, throughout the 22 years that I've been doing this, uh, I've made a whole ton of money by going against the flow or whatever the current current is with regard to what retail is saying about a specific thing. Specifically, if it's an expandable product, if it's something that's difficult, if it's something that looks like it's harder to carry because the publisher, the re- the distributor has done something to the game to make it so that there's an additional challenge to it. You've got to sign a contract or you've got to sign up with a specific thing in order to make it happen. Those things are exciting to me because I, I will I will take the extra three to five to 10 to 15 minutes to do whatever that thing is so that I have the opportunity to carry it. And if they're not, that means there's less sales outlets out there to, for me to compete with. So I'm even more excited. If there's only 12 or 24 retailers that are carrying this product, I'm not worried about whether it's a unique product that I'm bringing to my customers in a way where they're gonna look at it and go, oh, wow, this is pretty amazing. I didn't even know this thing existed. Um, so that's, a, that's one way that I measure buzz. The other way that I measure buzz is most of the larger conventions I attend and I try to get on the floor as much as I possibly can in between meetings to look at what's happening on that floor, to see what's selling out, to see what people are playing, to see just to notice on the periphery what they're carrying around. Their bags matter. The conversations with the publishers are always important at that point. Uh, The end of the show is tends to be a little more valuable. The beginning and the end of the show are the most valuable time for me to sort of try to get a gauge on what buzz is like. Because if I do a circle and I talk to the re- to the publishers that are bringing product that I think has a good shot of, you know, I'll use quotation marks here, winning the show, which that's what I'm looking for when I go to a bigger convention. What game in here wins, is winning the show? Last year at Gen Con, it was very obvious that Lorcana was going to win the show. Uh, a lot of eyeballs on that. I, I focused no attention on Lorcana at Gen Con at all. I didn't spend one minute in a line. I didn't talk to one person over at Ravensburger. I didn't need to do that work. That that was already done. If I hadn't figured out Lorcana was going to be good before that show, then I should probably look at applications in another industry. Since I didn't have to do that and I didn't have to waste the time trying to navigate that other than get in between their lines and, and not have to deal with you know all the crowding that occurred because of it, what's the next game? Where's the next space for me to have opportunity? What what am I going to be able to take a look at? So I got to go over to the Renegade booth. They had just announced that they got Avalon Hill games. Um, I wanted to see what their what their offers are going to look like as far as reprints, have a conversation about what's coming down the line. That's a line of games that we did really, really well with. I wanted to talk to Scott specifically about um, what, how much of the catalog do you have? What are you doing? There was a conversation about HeroScape. There was a lot of stuff going on. So... I also got to sit down with um, Maz from Rowan, Rook, and Descartes, a, a, an awesome up-and-coming RPG publisher that's had a couple of home runs, has a very unique look, brings something to the space that people aren't necessarily paying attention to, and talk to her and her team and see what they're doing because the stuff that they're releasing matters. So that's sort of how I handle buzz. Uh, number four is price point. There's not a lot to talk about as far as price point goes. There used to be this thing about heft. Oh, if you you pick up a game and you hold a game, you can tell if it's a forty dollar game or is it is it a fifty dollar game or oh, there's a lot of heft in here. This looks like a sixty dollar game. That's just not a thing anymore. You can still use it as a as a guide, but price points are sort of all over the place at this point. What people can produce and what their cost to produce goods are varies wildly. Transit time, shipping, that sort of stuff. So things are all over the place. So looking at a game, and I guess I'll pick on two-player games here because there's just two players there. A two-player game that costs more than $40 a lot of times is just a non-starter for me. It's not necessarily 100% of the time, but I've got the opportunity to only play this game with two players. How many times am I going to play it with just two players? If it's over $40, 
uh, what's the likelihood that they're going to grab another person to play it with outside of maybe their significant other or roommate or that's that type of thing when it when i look at it, the two-player game space and maybe that means there's opportunity i mean we we sell fog of love we sell a couple of other games it's called Callo, that sort of thing they're more expensive but it's definitely in the 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 lower end of it that said the same thing when it comes to party games if you've got a 70 or 80 dollar party game it's probably something i'm going to pass on unless it comes with you know a robot in a vacuum that cleans up after the party so price point is important in that it's sort of a gut check and a litmus for does is this thing going to be relevant um the new hasbro game that eric lang is doing is going to be super relevant to the market i don't believe they've announced the price point yet i think the price point is going to be really exciting uh, number five is designers so some designers actually have the ability to move the needle on a game the majority of the designers that are out there most average board game customers have no idea who designs the games that they play and the games that they love most of them it doesn't impact it at all it's the same thing that i'll say about brands uh most of the board game customers that i have that come through the door that aren't here for friday night board gaming every single night probably couldn't tell me the brand of their favorite board game it's just not the way that things are done they they don't focus on the publishers we don't have a nike or a reebok or anything like that we've got most of the places are just smaller studios and stuff and while they're trying to craft and curate a catalog that's attractive to all these different places the majority of people just have no idea who makes what games designers on the other hand have have certain followings i mentioned eric lang earlier martin wallace has a following vladish Adel has a following elizabeth hargrave um, bruno cathala um, there's there's a there's a number of them in the industry that have been around for a long time and they have people that will look at their game regardless of what they're... Richard Garfield's another one that it, when his name goes on the box, it can move the needle by itself because the success of what they've done in the past is, is evocative. In the in the CCG space, I would say that's probably um, uh, Mike Elliott. And Mike Elliott is a designer that's well-known for CCGs. A lot of the stuff that he works on gets a lot of eyeballs because of how successful he's been in the past. So designers is also another way that I take a look at what I'm going to bring in um, and maybe add a little bit more if it's got one of those AAA designers attached to it. Is the game licensed? That's number six. Um, licensed products have gotten more and more popular as our industry has gotten more and more popular. There's more and more places that are willing to license stuff to us. How strong is the license? Is the license oversaturated? Is it undersaturated? Is it, does the game fit? the consumer base that's excited about that particular license like if if i did a, a, a attack on titan game and it was all about beach volleyball i'm not sure that that game's going to hit with that fan base that's probably not what they're looking for um, but maybe i don't know throw me a throw me a pitch on a beach volleyball attack on titan game and i'll and i'll give it a whirl so licensed or unlicensed is something that comes into play i think the uvs critical role challenger decks is something that's <laughs> probably below radar for two for more people than it should be uh it's going to be the first time that any critical role fan which there's a billion of them are allowed to play a game using their favorite characters critical roles around there's a ton of viewers i think they get you know between 60 and 80 thousand every episode live those decks are going to be super important they're going to sell to a larger than normal base of customers because you get to play those characters for the first time as a player and nobody else has really touched that thing uh, number seven is innovation slash disruption uh, when i look at things like a key forge uh, star wars destiny dice masters the new altered tcg these are games that are going to come into the marketplace and they're doing something a little bit different or something that hadn't been done before they're innovating on something that maybe it's a technology piece that they've added to the game that wasn't part of the game before and it isn't just this extra thing that's a narrator for the game it actually helps you play and it makes the play experience better innovation is super important i think it's also one of the things that so many retailers shy away from because it's different it's not something that they understand they don't know what the market's going to be it's scary I don't know if this is going to be something that my customers are going to care about. This is a, a completely unique deck. Why would anybody want to do that? They can't customize it. So innovative, disruptive games are my favorite games because the opportunity is endless. If you know how to evaluate that game and look at the game from a positive spin and say, this is doing something that's a little bit different. 
I'm not looking for a game that I'm going to have on my shelf for 20 years. I'm looking for a game that I'm going to sell as many copies of I can as I can in the first 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days, and continue to do well with that game. If it's an expandable game and I'm carrying it for three to five years, perfect. It's bucked the trend of most of them. But it's my job to find games that are super important to my customers, bring them in regardless of whether they ask them, regardless of whether they ask me for them, and then see what they do in my space. If it's, a, if it's a game that requires tournaments and events, sometimes the events alone, if they're cool enough, can be a reason why I bring in a game to put in front of customers because I know I'm, I'm, I'm not just selling them a game, I'm selling them the experience. And the experience comes from a robust organized play program that players actually care about and matters. So that's my, my list of seven. I'm gonna do an honorable mention and my honorable mention is, and this is specific, given the fact that I'm on my way to Gamma and at the during the weekend. Um, does the game have a, a a sale or some kind of a special pricing associated with it? Sometimes you can find those on Kickstarters. Sometimes you can find those on trade shows. So maybe I've been tire kicking and I want to toe dip myself into a miniatures line or something like that, and I happen to be at I happen to be at Gamma and. Parabellum has their new miniatures game Conquest or their older miniatures game Conquest there, but there happens to be a bundle deal and I'm going to save myself, you know, a couple of extra points and I get a free two player starter and I, I, I get some other bells and whistles and things that will at times push me over the edge to say, okay, let me take a look at this game now. I, some of my hesitation with regard to the investment that I'm making in the game is going to go out the window because I've got a benefit they're giving me a larger starter set they're giving me something that goes along with it there's a widget that i get to to hand to the people that play in the demo if i run a demo there's extra things that the publisher has done to make some of my concerns my trepidation removed from that occasionally there's full returnability full returnability to some people i think is super super important but most of the time that's to in my experience full returnability doesn't do much for me because i'm not typically willing to order it at such a volume that sending back pallets makes sense for me. There are games that I order by the pallet, not very many of them. And if I'm ordering it by the pallet, I'm confident enough that I'm going to sell an amount where I'm not going to want to return that game anyway. So that it's it's a benefit. Returnability is a benefit that, that can be there. It's something that works at a lot of big box stores and things like that, but they're dealing with different levels of quantity. Most most stores, game stores in the industry are not ordering so many that 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 makes sense or they're not going to they're not willing to take that big of a swing to try to put it in there to see what's going to sell for better or worse. So, when it comes to trade shows, one of the other things that that help me when I'm picking products as a as an aside is when I have my retail friends that are there, we all walk the show floor separate. Uh, we spend however long it takes, 45 minutes or an hour. Sometimes it's longer than that. And we just take pictures of things that are interesting to us. After we've taken those pictures and after we've all gone through the hall, we go and grab a coffee or we go and grab lunch and we just start going through our phones and we compare our phones with each other. And we show the pictures of the games that we took a look at and that were interesting to us. <clears throat> It was myself and two other retailers for the majority of the time that I've been doing this. When we found games that all three of us took pictures for, that was something that we were going to do another cycle through the hall for to talk to them specifically because they obviously mattered. There was something about that game that made the three of us look at that game, take the picture. Now it's it's probably a hit. It's definitely something that we want to order. So we would go through the hall the second time based on what we looked at that all of us thought was curious or fun and then the other thing that happened too with the cameras is you can't see everything um you you have sometimes there's blinders when it comes to getting to somebody's booth uh you can't see all the stuff that they have put up so using the picture method allows us to get together and go oh you know what i didn't even notice that there oh this was on the shelf over there because i was focused on the thing that they had on the demo table i didn't look at the other thing and that allowed us to have that conversation too. So going through the trade, do, going through trade show floors with somebody that you respect at separate times to take a look at things is super, super critical. 
So that's going to be everything for today. Again, uh, I'm going to do 10 minutes after this. And I'm going to open that up to any kind of Q&A. And then we're going to fire on the, f- the next episode right after this. Uh, next episode is going to be all about taking the things that you learned at the trade show, the things that you got excited about, and then putting them into practice when you get home without all of your reta- all of your employees wanting to quit and your customers thinking that you're changing your business model. So we'll see you back here next time. Thanks.